Funding for the production of Folks is made possible in part by a grant from Union National Life Insurance, serving Louisiana and the South since 1926, a family-managed corporation providing whole life insurance. Straight ahead on Folks, how are black professionals competing for their share of clients in the current economic climate? Is competition against white professionals helping or hurting? We'll also meet Mark Katz and Robert Jackson, two very special friends, all on today's edition of Folks. Hello everyone and welcome to Folks. I'm Sonia Massengale. A generation or so ago, all a black lawyer or doctor had to do to attract clients was to open his office in the black community and hang out his shingle along with a discreet announcement that he was open for business. Well, things have changed. For most professionals, it is no longer a sound business practice to rely exclusively on any one source of patrons. Competition for professionals is steep during these days of the declining dollar power. Startup costs and insurance rates are ever increasing. Add to that the lower disposable incomes of most people, a savvy consumer who shops for the best bargain, and the fact that when opening shop in a new profession, blacks are less likely to have the varied support systems of their white counterparts. Today we're going to meet three black professionals who are thriving in their respective fields. We begin with Thomas Perkins, Jr., a Baton Rouge attorney who tells us that to get ahead in the legal world, Black lawyers must not limit their practice to black clients, but should always maintain an active role in the black community. Thomas Perkins, Jr. began his distinguished law career while a student at Harvard. People still remember the time when he sued the New Orleans Athletic Club back in the early 70s for racial discrimination and won. He is now a senior partner of Blosh & Perkins, a law firm in Baton Rouge, specializing in business law and governmental relations. He says that black lawyers risk failure if they limit their practice to black clients only. I guess we start with the, with the premise that you are, when you, when you start a law firm, you're starting a business. And if you don't keep in mind the whole time that, you know, this is a profession, yes, but you're actually operating a business. So you've got to, to approach this from a business standpoint. The biggest problem that black lawyers have in doing business is, is basically finding your market. You know, if, if you look at, at the legal market as a pie, for instance, uh, the we, black lawyers have access to only a small slice of that pie. Basically, you've got whites who go to a, uh, white clients go to white lawyers for the most part. Now, there are exceptions to that, but y you're looking at a situation where instead of having access to the entire pie, we've only got a slice of it. We've only got that black market to go after. And then among that black market, there are a significant number of blacks that go to white lawyers. So that slice of the pie must then be divided again in half or a quarter or whatever, whatever that percentage may be. So the, the market for black lawyers is a very small one if we limit ourselves to the black market. So what steps do you take to ensure that you have a chance at that larger slice of the pie in business? You've got to make a commitment to approaching the majority businessman the majority market, the white market, and, and telling them our services are available. You know, you've got to make a decision that we're not going to limit ourselves to only going after the black market. And you've got to, you've got to basically develop a marketing strategy. You've got to go out there and take that gentleman to lunch, write him letters, approach him and tell him I want your business, and here's why it's, it makes good business sense for you to do it. They're not going to give you business because you're black. That's, uh, those days may be gone at this point. But if you can approach them 
with a reason why it makes good economic sense for you to do business with me, then we found that while it's difficult, it, you can get some fairly receptive people out there who are willing to say, okay, this, is, this could work, and I see some interest in, for my business in doing business with your firm, and you've got to make that decision. Now, what, what it means is you've got to invest the money in the physical plant so that when you bring people to your office, they see you've got a nice place, they see you, you, you're able to produce the services that they're, that they're paying for. And if you can do that, we found that they, you can have some, some success in breaking into some of those other markets. Perkins Law Firm is multi-ethnic, and where racial issues rarely surface on the job, he is aware of the public's perception of black lawyers. I, I guess you've got attitudes from both the black perspective and the white perspective. And the attitude is almost identical from both perspectives. Whites don't think that we're capable of producing the same quality legal services that white lawyers are capable of producing, which I don't think is true. I think that black lawyers are just as well qualified as, as white lawyers, but we've got that perception to deal with. Then you look in the black community, and you find surprisingly so that that, that same perception is there, that black lawyers are not going to provide them the same type of legal services that the, that the, white, that the white lawyer can. So we have got black lawyers have a very special obligation to make sure that when they do get clients, they do a good job because we're fighting on both, end, both ends of the racial spectrum. We're fighting a perception that we are not as competent uh, professionals as a white lawyer. Do you feel that the black lawyer has a particular obligation to the black community? Be because historically, so much of the business that we have has been exclusively from the black community. We owe the black community the support that they have given us, which means we have got to return to the community, and there are innumerable ways to do it. You know, I, I, I don't see any one particular way that you do it, but it may be politically, it may be in your church community, it may be uh, participating in the schools, it may be pro bono work for individuals. There are a number of ways that you can, can interact and contribute to the community, and it may be monetary. There may be situations where you support certain programs because you got to give some of that money back. If you're putting it all in your pocket and not returning some of it, either monetarily or socially or in some manner, if you're not returning some of it to the community, then it's very difficult for you to say, I expect you to come to me and, and make, make my finances better when you're not returning something to the people who, who are responsible for that. We've been hearing a lot about the overcrowded legal profession. Do you think that law will continue to be a good area for blacks to go into? At one time, it was being said, around the time I got out of school, that there were too many blacks going into law, too many people going into law, too many women going into law. Um, it's an overcrowded profession. You'll never make it if you go into law. Is it going to continue to be a good profession for black professionals? I think so. Uh, we have to understand that it's a very competitive marketplace. And just like there are lots of do doctors, lawyers, accountants, in every marketplace, we're getting new people every day. The legal profession is no different. What that means is that we've got to be more on our P's and Q's. We've got to be more aggressive in, in, in keeping our market together, in, in expanding our markets, in doing a good job. But I think, and I think that many lawyers will agree with this, black lawyers, that if you do a good job, you, you get the business, you keep the business, and you grow. And it can continue to be a rewarding profession. Now, you know, those who are on the fringe, who are not doing a good job, I don't think that has anything to do with black or white. It's a matter of whether you work hard and, and pr provide competent legal services. And as long as you're, you're, you're doing that, as long as you're making that goal, it can be a very rewarding uh, process and, and something that, that you can make a living at. Our next feature profiles Dr. Helen Hedgeman, a Baton Rouge pediatrician who moved her practice back to Louisiana after several years on the West Coast. 
She has found that the double dilemma of being black and female does not impact a successful medical practice in a negative way. I had a little doll when I was a little girl. Her name was Mrs. Dawkins. She was named after a second grade teacher of mine. And I was the doctor to Mrs. Dawkins for so long that I finally decided I was going to be a real doctor other than a doctor for a doll. Helen Hedgeman is a pediatrician. She went to medical school at a time when it was still uncommon for a black, let alone a woman, to practice medicine. Although she was aware of the attitude she had to face, she remembered no problems in her training that related to her sex or color. Either I didn't have a number of things to happen to me as a, a black female, or I didn't commit them to, uh, commit them to memory. Uh, it's very likely that some of these things did happen to me, but uh, I pretty much keep a positive attitude and I don't commit a whole lot of things to memory. And uh, most of the things that happened to me really were really pre-medical, pre-professional uh, days before I even decided to become a professional. And uh, I really can't remember anything particular that was uh, oriented toward not being male, you know, that, that happened to me. After practicing medicine in Los Angeles for some time, Hedgeman chose to return to her native Baton Rouge. While her race caused no problems in the early years of her practice, she has noticed some attitude differences in her Baton Rouge office. I have had some experience with that. I, that's something that has not passed away from my memory yet. Uh, here in Baton Rouge, we have a great deal of a, of a mixed population. Uh, it might be where we're located that has something to do with it, but my partners and I uh, were running a 60-40 practice, 60% 60, 60 white and a 40% black at one time. Uh, we have noticed uh, on occasion to find some white flight when they find out that we're black, uh, or we have found that a number of uh, telephone calls that come into the office, one of the questions that they ask about the practice is the doctor black. So we have found quite a bit of uh, attitudinal problems about that, you know, and we, especially with uh, some of the prepaid health plans where they have, they are, the, the parents, well, I say parents because I'm a pediatrician, but the subscriber is in the position where he or she has to make a decision about a doctor blindly. Having grown up in, in Baton Rouge in the 60s and, and had been one of the first five or six blacks to enter LSU on court order in 1964, haven't seen some raw prejudices at that time. Uh, uh, when I came back, I expected to see some remnants of that, but it has not. Other than what I just mentioned, I find it very surprising that the, the general attitude of Baton Rouge is very good. Very good. Average doctor income is falling, and malpractice insurance costs are soaring. And yet only 3% of the nation's doctors, optometrists, and dentists are black. It's got to be affecting you. How are you handling it? In Los Angeles, the opportunity to make money in the medical field and the opportunity to spend money are first cousins. You know, you, you, the, the, the availability is there, yet it's something on the other side taking it. Be it malpractice premium, be it uh, office space premiums, be it membership on hospital staff or whatever, there's something always to eat your income, but there's, there's always something to give you income. In Louisiana, uh, since the two years that I've been here, I've noticed that there is more to eat your income than it is to bring in your income. Uh, I can directly attribute that to uh, the problems that the state is having and uh, people are seeking medical help on, on fewer bases now, you know. And the, the income is just different, you know, and uh, I have seen it uh, dwindle. And the malpractice premiums, even though they are lower than I had to pay in other states, uh, it, it, it eats a lot out of your income, you know. So how do you cope with it? First of all, you have to build yourself on a positive attitude. You know that people are going to need medical help, and you know that you're not, if you put yourself in a position where you uh, are not going to fail, if you just follow certain principles, you just don't fail. And, and you just have a pretty much a positive attitude. And you don't worry about uh, uh, the money not coming in in a proper fashion because it eventually comes. It comes in sort of like a roller coaster one month. 
you had a peak another month you had a trough and it's just you know it, it balances out so you just have to kind of use it like that you know louisiana money problems aside hedgeman's practice is thriving however she and her partner have found that there are a few headaches that go along with that success the thing that i'm concerned about the most is the lack of maternal instinct in bad news mothers with reference and i think it has a lot to do with age but they are calling the doctor now for some bread and butter mothering. You know, uh, the baby has, oh, constipation, you know, and you get a 3 a.m. 3 a.m. call about constipation. And I had one of my colleagues say, oh, your grandmother, <laughs> you know, is she, is she around? It's a grandmother thing, you know. It's, in Baton Rouge, the health, the health needs are so different here. You know, you have to be the jack of all trades. You have to be the mother. You have to be the professional. And you have to be sometimes a spiritual advisor. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but you have a lot of hats to wear in Baton Rouge. Do you feel that the black doctor has an obligation to the black community? Well, black, black doctors definitely have an obligation to the community uh, in that the community is the root of the black doctor. Uh, being born and raised here in Baton Rouge, I have a good feeling about returning to Baton Rouge to practice, and our obligations really to the community will be to educate and to set examples of black professionalism and to make sure that uh, everything we do is ethical and in the standards of care and so forth. And I think that if we would just, you know, orient ourselves to knowing the plights of black people and how we can serve as professionals, it will it will be it will return to the community. You know, in your professional skills and in your educating abilities and so forth. The next story features Dr. Hugh McKnight, an engineer who turned from suspension bridges to dental bridges and has found his new profession rewarding. Hugh McKnight started his professional life as an engineer. After receiving his master's degree in engineering and teaching for a while, he found that he needed a PhD to advance his career. He decided then to become a dentist. So when Hugh McKnight builds a bridge, he really builds that bridge. He has been a dentist now for almost 20 years and says that startup costs are still a problem for black dentists. And it's quite uh, vivid at this point in time is that of being able to finance, uh, to obtain finance to set up a dental practice, to set up a dental office facility, a practice facility, uh, that tend to be difficult. And if you do not have some uh, assets uh, like a home, uh, some real intangible asset that you can use as collateral uh, to secure a loan, uh, you tend to kind of be out there. It's very difficult to say, well, I have a dental degree and I'm going to be practicing, that, practicing at this, ad this address and uh, I need $60,000. Another area, once you get going, you overcome that obstacle and uh, get your facility uh, from which to practice, uh, hang out your shanga. People don't just come churning in, pushing your door down. Uh, you have to, to do a number of different things in the area we call marketing of yourself uh, to begin to get a few people to come your direction. McKnight finds that many people have a poor image of black professionals in general, but many of the negative attitudes can be reversed with consistently good service. Almost any black group provides services and our products. Uh, the black consumer just tend to say to them, you got to prove that what you provide uh, is worth my considering. Uh, just because you are black and, and I'm a black consumer, that's not enough to put us together. You, you, you really got to prove that what you deliver uh, is worth my considering. Since he has chosen to serve the black community primarily, McKnight has noted some positive changes in the overall response of blacks to good dental care. The middle income people will tend to seek more dental care and at the same time have better or in, in dental care because their education level generally is higher and they they catch on and and will follow through on preventive means 
So they tend to need less repair dentistry because they come on more on a regular basis for preventive care. It's been said that doctor income is falling and the malpractice costs and cost of setting up practices is going up. Do you find that true in the dental profession also? Considerations such as malpractice insurance, uh, the cost of uh, dental laboratory services, uh, the cost of dental supplies, uh, all of these uh, entities that we must have in order to practice continue to escalate in price and we cannot uh, just arbitrarily increase our fees uh, to fully offset. In other words, if, if I have uh, dental supplies go up on January 1 by 5% across the board, it's not likely that I can just increase my fees by 5% across the board and just pass that on through. So the way I attempt to compensate is perhaps increase my fees somewhat, but I constantly struggle to improve my efficiency and hold down other overhead costs as I practice dentistry. Most people fear going to the dentist. Why are we so fearful and what do you do to help people overcome that? The degree to which I can, can find answers to that question, and I say answers because maybe more than one, I think impacts seriously on my practice in terms of the number of clientele because uh, just too many of them who do come are just almost overcome by fear. And many times they are only here because the pain exceeded the, the intensity of the fears, so they had no, <laughs> they felt at that point they had no real choice. McKnight does a great deal of talking to his patients to educate them about dental health and also to calm their fears. For the fearful adult patient, he prescribes a combination of education and techniques to relax and raise the pain threshold for potentially painful procedures. But he hopes to eliminate fear of dentists for children before it starts. We would like to see the children get to be teenagers without having fillings, but just their natural dentition. All teeth intact, gums healthy. Now, if you step down one level, they can become teenagers with the teeth filled. But more ideally is that they become teenagers with no fillings, just their natural dentition. And the knowledge of how to care for their mouths, which is something that can take them on throughout their lives. They might go on for years beyond teenage years with no fillings, just the natural dentition. And that's, in my mind, the ultimate goal uh, as we provide dental care. Now our final story for today introduces us to a big buddy, little buddy team that has been together for over three years. Mark Katz and Robert Jackson are very special to each other. Mark is Robert's big buddy as well as his best friend. The day that we met, it was real funny. We went to his apartment complex and I'd never met him before. And I talked to Palm and I, we decided the child that I would probably work best, best with. And they trained me and they, you know, put me through workshops to learn how to work with the children. And I went to his complex and one young child just came running out of the blue and it was really funny because he jumped and his legs went around me and his arms went around me and he hugged me. That was the very first time that I ever met him. Robert Trey made me realize how fortunate I am. I mean, when I first joined the program, you know, I didn't realize that there was another half. You know, people live so much differently than the way I did. And just getting to know Robert and being with him and meeting his family and the children in the neighborhood, it's just given me a perspective that I can go on and I can be strong and I can do the things that I want to do and be happy about it, you know, and don't have to look back. I think it's a mutual satisfaction between me and Robert. There, it's hard to say the joy in the kids' faces are probably the most important thing. When they really achieve something that they really didn't know that they could do and they work hard and, and it's just, it's the pleasure, I think, on the children's faces that gives me the most, the most satisfaction. Thanks to Mark, Robert has memories of some very special times. We left the store, went over to his house, 
and went up to his apartment. And when he opened the door and turned on the lights, they had a surprise party for me. And they had a radio, some glasses, a gobot, cake, ice cream, and lots of other things. And after I uh, opened all of my presents, uh, they uh, they just told me happy birthday. It made me so happy I wanted to cry. It takes a lot of time and dedication to become a big buddy, and it takes a lot of love to develop the friendship Mark and Robert have. Robert is a remarkable child. When me and Robert got together, it was really funny. He's, he's got a physical handicap that you can see and everybody can see, but nobody knows it. I mean, everybody knows it except for Robert. You know, Robert goes around and he lives life. And Robert has taught me more about living, about courage, because Robert does things even though he's handicapped and doesn't realize it. Robert is just, he, he's a happy child with a lot of positive enthusiasm. And I think that's what makes him so special. And I think that's why we work together so well. If you are interested in sponsoring a little buddy, please contact the Big Buddy organization where you live. And that's it for our program today. See you next week for another edition of Folks. Bye-bye. Funding for the production of Folks is made possible in part by a grant from Union National Life Insurance, serving Louisiana and the South since 1926, a family-managed corporation providing whole life insurance.